All right, so for this video, we are going to go over putting medications through an NG tube. The process is very similar if you have a core pack, which is um, one of the small tubes. It's very similar if you have a core pack that you'll do it the same way, as well as if you have a patient that has a um, peg tube. Okay, so the process is fairly similar, but we're gonna focus on through the NG tube. So patient could have the NG tube in place um, for medication administration and nutrition. We could also use it for decompression of the stomach. Um, say they have like a bowel obstruction or something like that. Um, but we're gonna focus on the medication portion of it for right now. Of course, with any medication, we would have to have our order in place. We would also want to have had a x-ray to confirm placement of our NG tube and have an order for it to be okay to use, which we do have in our orders. Um, we would need a med crusher. This is what we have here on campus. Um, you, some of the other facilities have stuff called a silent night where you put the med in a pouch and then you crush it. Um, you also could have liquid medications that are in the bottle, or you could have some that are in like a single dose cup. You'll also need water, warm tap water is fine. Uh, you don't want cold because it'll cause cramping. You don't want anything too hot because that will cause scalding. Um, medicine cups, your stethoscope, if your facility requires a pH, you would want to get the pH um, packet so that you could test that. And then you also need gloves. Okay, so I have my orders. I know that it's okay for me to use my NG tube and my patient is requesting for cough syrup and um, they have a pain, a three out of 10 and they wanted some ibuprofen. So we're going to get some guaifenesin cough syrup. We're also going to give them some ibuprofen. They haven't had any within the past six hours or whatever the time frame was for the PRN. We look at their medical history and their allergies to make sure they don't have allergies to these medications um, and past medical history. In particular for these medications, if they have a history of GI ulcers or gastric bleeding, anything like that, then we would probably want to be avoiding the ibuprofen. We don't see anything like that going on in their history. So we have our supplies that we're getting ready to go to the bedside with. And I'm in the med room, so I'm gonna get my med cups. And I'm gonna get my medication, so I'm gonna go and pull out my first medication, which is gonna be my guaifenesin. So when I pull this out of the drawer or out of the Pixis is my first check and I'm looking at the name of the medication, the dose and the expiration date to make sure it's not expired. So that's my first check. And my second check, I'm essentially doing the same thing. If I wanted to pour in the med room, I could. I would have to make sure that my medicine cups are labeled. I'm gonna wait until I go to the room to pour it. So I've done two med checks there. My next one, I'm pulling out, getting the ibuprofen, 600 milligrams, and making sure that it's not expired, and it's matching with the MAR as well. 100 uh, ibuprofen, 600 milligrams, and it's not expired, so that's a second med check. And I know that I'm gonna need to crush it, so I'm going to have my pill crusher with me. So you need to know whether your pills can be crushed or not. Um, because if not, we're gonna have to find a different way to be able to administer them to the patient. We might need to call pharmacy and get it changed to a liquid um, or a pill that's crushable. Um, we would also want to not crush any sustained release, um, capsules, some capsules we might be able to open, some not. So again, you'd have to refer to pharmacy to verify that that would be okay. If I needed to calculate any dosages, I could do that with another nurse if I had to um, outside of the room. So I'm ready to go into the room, get my patient identifiers, wash my hands, 
and asked Miss Mary Jean how she's doing. And she said, well, I told you that I'm coughing and I'm having pain. She is in for pneumonia. And I'm, so I've got your cough syrup for you. And I also have some ibuprofen. Um, can you tell me your name and your date of birth? And she gives me those. And then do you have any allergies? She says her allergy is to ACE inhibitors. I'm not giving either of those, so I am okay. So I've done pre-med assessments. I'm then going to, I'm gonna get my gloves. Make sure your bed is lifted up to a comfortable position. NG tube, 30 degrees, head of the bed. I'm going to expose her abdomen and I'm going to auscultate first to make sure we have some bowel sounds. Okay, so we saw she has normal active bowel sounds and I'm gonna gently palpate for any pain, distension, or tenderness, and she's denying any complaints of that. Okay. If she had tube feeding running, I would stop it and put it on pause. I would need to know whether the medication can be given immediately with the tube feed, or did I need to stop the tube feeding prior to and wait and then come and do the med? And then I also need to know um, after I get the medications, do I need to hold the tube feeding for a little bit or not? With these two particular medications, I do not. Um, but right now she is not on tube feeding. We're just gonna go directly through her NG tube here. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna verify placement. So the first way we did was we made sure that it's okay to use with the chest X-ray. But then for all of these other times, because they're not going to do a chest x-ray every single time, we're going to look at this little mark. Usually it's with a magic marker. And this one's at 54 centimeters. And that's what's charted in the computer. It says 54 centimeters is at the mark for the nostril. So I know that it should be in the stomach. Now the next thing I need to do is... I'm going to aspirate a little bit of stomach content to visualize it and look and see. Um, so right now I have it completely clamped. This blue tail here, we never put anything down it. This is for venting only. This allows air to escape from the stomach. So we never put anything down this blue, uh, we call it the pigtail. We never put anything down there. So I, you see I have it clamped and that's to keep stomach residual from getting all over the bed, which can happen. So I'm gonna put my piston syringe on there, release, and I'm gonna pull back about 10 milliliters or so and look at the color. And it should be a bile color. Um, if they've recently had tube feeding, there could be a little bit of a cream color. There could be a little bit of curdle look to it. If I needed to do a gastric pH, I'd get my little gastric halt or my whoop, gastric pH and put it on there. And then I would put my testing on there and wait for it to develop. Five or less is good for our pH. And then we are going to check our residual volume. So gastric residual volume or GRV. So we've got this in place. Say I still have that 10 because my facility doesn't require me to check a pH, but I looked at the color of it. It looks consistent with stomach secretions. I'm gonna pull until I don't get any more um, fluid back. So we'll say it stopped. I'm at 44 milliliters. And I could gently push this back in. Um, say I have more than what I have in my syringe, say there's a hundred, say I, I pull back and I get 60. I'm going to put it into my little container here and I'm going to go back and I'm going to pull more. Let's say I have a hundred. Okay. And that it stopped there. 
I would want to know what is excessive. Um, the Elsevier products say 250 or more is excessive. You also want to look at your facility's policy and you also want to consider the size of your patient. If you have a 95 pound patient who's been getting tube feeding at 40 milliliters per hour and you're doing a check before meds, say four hours after the tube feeding and they should have had a total of 160 in those four hours, you do a residual check and there's a hundred left in the stomach after those four hours, then we could have a big issue with them being able to process their, their food. So we need to take it all in context. But for testing purposes here in the lab, we're saying 250 or more is excessive. And in that case, we would not put any of this residual back, okay? We're at 100, we're good. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this residual back because it has the gastric acids in it to help with digesting the food. So I'm going to gently uncrimp this. Make sure that this is about 18 inches above. Allow it to go down. Pour the rest of it in. Allow it to go down. So all 100 of that went in to the patient. Then the next thing is I need to flush after that. So I'm going to flush with 30 to 60 mLs of the tap water. I'm going to go ahead and flush with my 30 and wait for that to go down. I'm just going to clamp this because I didn't prepare my meds yet. Um, which I probably should have done ahead of time, but we're going to do that right now. So I did do a water flush. I'm going to do my third med check here for my Goifenesin. It's not expired and it's fun, uh, 100 milligrams per 5 mLs. I need to give 500 mLs or 500 milligrams, so I'm going to give 25 mLs. And I'm going to cover the label of the medication in the palm of my hand if it's coming from a bottle. So that I don't ruin the integrity of the bottle. Okay. All right, then I'm going to prepare a flush of 15 to 30 in between each med. Again, bearing in mind any patient that has any specific um, health concerns like fluid restrictions, we might not be putting as much water in. But I did 30 to flush in the residual. I'm going to do my med. I'm going to flush with 15. Then I'm going to do the second med, which is my ibuprofen, which I need to crush. So I do my third med check, ibuprofen. The dose is 600 milligrams and it's not expired. And if we're using the barcoding, we would scan prior to opening the package. You want it to be a really nice fine powder. So that you can mix it with the water, usually about 10, 15 ml or so. You can see it's ground down into a nice fawn powder. Then I'm going to add in, I'm going to do 15 mLs to mix in with that. And then I'm going to do 30 to 60 at the very end after I'm done with my head. So I do 30 to 60 before I do a medication. I do 15 to 30 in between each med. And then my, after my final med will be 30 to 60. Um, and you do not mix pills and everything all up together. They should be done individually so that it's not changing the chemical component and efficacy of the medication. All right. 
we did our flush. We go in. We are going to give the guaifenesin, the cough syrup. And that was all given. I'm going to allow it to go most of the way down. I'm going to crimp it back up. Now I'm doing my 15 of my tap water. Let it go most of the way down. And then I'm gonna make sure that this mixes a little bit better by swirling it around. I'm gonna dump in my um, ibuprofen pill with the water. Make sure it goes most of the way down. And then finally, I will do my final flush of 30 to 60, which I'm doing 30. And I'm gonna allow that to go down. I'm gonna crimp it back up. And I'm gonna put this back to close. So that way it's not leaking out. We have to leave the head of the bed up for an hour at least. Majority of these patients that have NG tubes are typically at like a 30 degree angle anyway. Um, but post med admin, if they're not hooked up to anything, at least one hour to stay up. If they have tube feeding and it's compatible with being able to restart right after the meds are given, then we would just, um, after that final flush, we would rehook the tube feeding and resume their tube feeding. And that's it.